Uh, okay, Douglas, you're, you're right. Okay, good morning, everybody. Those that I haven't uh, greeted yet, and from my side, uh, on behalf of myself, from Warmer Technologies, as well as Johan van Staden from uh, Technical Services and Projects, a heartily welcome to you to this morning's uh, breakfast lecture over here. I would just like to welcome everybody that are registered for the webinar as well. Uh, although they cannot see me, I would just like to say also a heartly word of welcome to everybody registered in the webinar. And I trust that it will be a very fruitful and informative hour or hour and a half uh, this morning. Now, there's just one or two little things that I need to mention to you, and that is that those of you that are registered with EXA, this breakfast lecture will carry CPD points. The problem that we're faced with at the moment is, as far as CPD points, it's not really a problem, it's just the issue, is the credits that you will earn depends on the length of the lecture, which means that this lecture will be monitored, it will be timed, and based on the length of the lecture, you will either get point 0.1 or point 0.2 or qualify for point 0.1 or point 0.2 CPD credits. Uh, Douglas is monitoring everything, he's timing it. And for those that are logged in in the webinar, those people can also earn CPD points. But the provision is that they must be logged in for the total duration of the lecture then they will be able to claim CPD points. So those are just one or two little logistical things that I think is very important to make clear before the time. Okay, so with all those little, let's say, uh, admin type of things behind us, we can now start. Now, what is the background to this lecture? The background to this lecture is that a couple of years ago, it was recognized and it's not only a couple of years ago, it's actually for a long period of time already, that it was recognized that safety equipment are actually not tested correctly according to what we will say the, the engineering standards that we need to test it with. And therefore, between myself and Yuan, we actually came together and said, what can we do about that? And we started implementing the correct measures and facilities to do these tests. So this lecture this morning will mostly be on the technical side. Right at the end, I will maybe do a little bit of marketing and so on, but it will be less than 5% of this whole lecture. So this thing will be about the, the real engineering technical side of voltage detectors and phase comparators. I think we all recognize that that is the two pieces of safety equipment on high voltage that is extremely important and that are used every day in all fields of the, uh, let's say, the power engineering field. So therefore, it is necessary to really understand how does the voltage detector work, what are the dangers regarding the voltage detectors and phase comparators, and then what are the requirements, and so on. So if we look at this, uh, then we can see some of the aspects of safety testing and safety equipment as far as voltage detectors. In other words, measuring a voltage. And all that measuring of the voltage has got to do and are a prerequisite for your high voltage safety rules and regulations. In other words, your uh, live working applications as well as maintenance, etc. So therefore one must recognize what are the conditions under which these devices, and there you can see a measuring or a device that are used for testing on a high voltage installation. Then what are the requirements for keeping that device in a good order? In other words, testing afterwards, verification before you work with it that it is still complying to what is necessary. 
And therefore, that little picture is just a little bit of showing how this device should be tested in a laboratory. In other words, what are the requirements? So other than that, let's look at what are we going to talk to about. This was a little bit of introduction. So I'm going to have a little talk on tests on electrical equipment and then looking at South African standards. So that will be a brief discussion on what are the standards and what are the requirements as far as these devices is concerned. So from that standards, we will have a look at voltage detectors itself, and then we will look at in-service tests. Now, the word in-service tests can be coupled with maintenance tests. Why do I use the word in-service tests? Because that is the terminology used in the standards itself. And we will look at what is the exact terminology. In other words, the, the requirement is while you have this equipment in service, what are the required tests to make sure and to ensure that this equipment is reliable? Because we must remember that this is safety equipment and people's lives depend on that. Then we will also look at face comparators. Now, those two devices are totally different. And later on, I'm going to make a statement which comes directly out of the standards. And that statement is that a face comparator cannot be used and should never be used as a voltage detector. It's a very debatable point where the people in the industry very often use the face comparator as a voltage detector, which is not correct. And a lot of people don't really understand why, because both of them indicate voltage present or voltage not present, present or what the condition is. But there's certain inherent things that one need to remember. What is the difference between the two and what are the different requirements? So therefore, I will go into that and explain why a face comparator cannot be used as a voltage detector. And then, coming back to the 10% uh, that I mentioned, which is a little bit of marketing, we will look at the test facility that is presently available, a brief introduction to the test facility that are at present available to do these tests, and then some examples of test experience that we had with voltage detectors specifically. So that is more or less what we will go through. If we now look at the, uh, and then, sorry, then there will questions and discussions afterwards. Now, a little bit of the procedure. I will do the presentation. Then questions, discussions afterwards will be shared by myself and Johan. So you are welcome to ask any question. If I can't answer it, Johan will answer it. And if both of us can't answer it, then we will research it and come back with an answer. Okay, so that is, write down your questions so that we can have a good question session afterwards. I must also mention to the people on, with, registered on the webinar that they have the facility or the ability to ask questions not voice questions, but they can type it in. Douglas will log them, and then at the end, he will act on behalf, or he will, uh, let's say, uh, mention the questions that the people registered in the webinar, and then we will answer those questions and that. So there's opportunity for everybody to do it. Okay, so let's look at the standards, or the tests. Now, in high voltage equipment and high voltage engineering, we all know that there's basically three tests that are always talked about. Now, the first test that we always talk about is really the test to verify the design of the equipment. And that is a type test. And it is very strange and very obvious to me. We, where I'm very 
involved in high voltage testing and that. That if you go to the industry and you order a piece of electrical equipment, let's say you order a transformer or you purchase a transformer, the first thing that they say is that transformer must be type tested and you need a type test certificate. Otherwise, you will not buy it. Why? Because it certifies that that transformer conformed to certain requirements, design requirements, manufacturing requirements, everything material requirements. How often do you see if you buy safety equipment? And I'm talking of high voltage safety equipment that you measure or detect voltage with. How often do the people specify they want a type test certificate for that equipment? Now, in South Africa, what are the conditions in South Africa as far as standards are concerned? Either IEC or SANS, South African National Standards, which means that equipment that you buy should comply to type testing according to a standard, and I'm going to mention the South African National Standard, because there is a South African National Standard for safety equipment, specifically voltage detectors and phase comparators. But the people are not aware of it. <laughs> they go to the procurement department, and they say, I want a voltage detector and the procurement department go and they buy the cheapest one that they can get because they want to save money. Which means that I found, and it might be different in your case, I found that there's a gap as far as the specification of high voltage test equipment when it is purchased. Which means that even that high voltage test equipment must actually comply to some or other standard, recognized standard. And in our case, it is the South African National Standard or SANS. Then the next test is a routine test. In other words, that is a test in the factory on equipment leaving the factory after manufacturing. That is normally performed under the supervision of the certification facility. So if one look at type tests, that can only be performed by an international or national accredited facility. Now, in our case in South Africa, we talk of SANAS accreditation. In other words, type tests need to be certified by a national or international accreditation facility that are accredited to do those tests. And unfortunately in South Africa, as far as high voltage safety equipment is concerned, we don't have any facility that can do a type test, a full type test on safety equipment or voltage detectors and phase comparators, which means that you now have to rely on a type test certificate from an international test facility, let's call it an overseas test facility. But it is something that need to be on the, pay, on the table, it's a type test certificate. And you must make sure, and it must be ensured, that that equipment has been type tested and certified. The difference now comes into routine tests. Routine tests in the factory, it's not necessary to do it through a accredited or a SANAS accredited facility or an international accredited facility because that is where it's manufactured. You cannot send each and every piece of equipment to be type tested. So it is routine tests to verify and that is done under the supervision of a certification facility which means that they will go and audit the manufacturers and say your test equipment and procedures comply and is reliable enough. It's the same with each and every piece of equipment that are manufactured. A motor, a transformer, a piece of cable. They go through a type test, they go through a routine test. 
and then it gets into the industry. And once it gets into the industry, now you need to do maintenance tests on that equipment. So what are the requirements for maintenance tests? That is to determine the condition of the equipment in the field. In other words, is it still safe to use or is it unsafe to use? Should it go for repairs or what are the condition? Now, there's a big, uh, let's say, misunderstanding regarding maintenance tests on high voltage test equipment. It's performed by experienced and approved companies and or facilities. Because we don't have manufacturers or an accredited test facility that can do type tests. Routine tests cannot be done in South Africa because there's no manufacturing of voltage detectors and phase comparators in South Africa. So the only thing that one can look at is maintenance tests. The user must now must know what criteria the equipment must comply to and what tests are needed for the safe operation of the equipment. So now we get into the gap. Because the people are not aware of the content exactly of the South African national standard, which is a copy of the IEC standard on voltage detectors and phase comparators. Because they're not aware of what the content of that is, they don't know what maintenance tests need to be done. And that's where the big, big problem comes in. Because now, doing maintenance tests for a voltage detector is, yes, the name imply, I must detect voltage present or voltage not present. Yes, that's easy. But what are the criteria to say voltage present or voltage not present. What are the uncertainty? What are the spectrum between saying present and not present? Are there anything regarding that? And that is what we will look at today, is what are that criteria that are mentioned in the standards, in the South African national standard, as far as in-service testing is concerned. So, that are the typical tests that need to be done on electrical high voltage safety equipment. We cannot do a type test in South Africa. We cannot do the routine tests in South Africa, but we need to be able to do the maintenance tests or so-called in-service tests in South Africa because we are using the equipment. We are responsible for the safety of the people that use that equipment. So from a user's point of view, we need to be able to know and recognize what tests are necessary to verify the safe and correct operation of that test equipment or that voltage detector or phase comparator that we are talking about. So that is the important aspects of the standards and the tests that are applicable to South Africa as far as safety equipment is concerned. Okay, so what are the standards? If we look at the South African national standards, as I mentioned, the IEC standards for voltage detectors and phase comparators were adopted as SANS standards. In other words, if you go onto that standard, you will see it says IEC slash SANS and then the standard number. So we comply fully as far as the adoption of the standards to the international recognized requirements. And my philosophy is always, can we differ from the international requirements? If the international requirements is specified which was researched by a very wide community, which was verified by experts as necessary. Can we say, no, we change it? We must have extremely good motivation to do that. And as far as the safety is concerned, we don't have that motivation. So the bottom line is that we need to comply to the international accepted standards, which was researched 
over many years and which is specified for equipment to comply to as far as safety is concerned. So if one look at the standards now, as I mentioned, there's no manufacturing facility in South Africa for the manufacturing of voltage detectors and phase comparators and all are therefore imported. So that is a very important thing that I'm saying there. We don't manufacture, so we can't type test. We cannot do routine tests on it. So what was the problem in the past, or what is still the problem? Because we can't type test, because we can't routine test, the people are not interested in knowing what are the criteria for that equipment to comply to as far as the uh, type test and routine test requirements are concerned. There's no facility or laboratory in South Africa that can do the full range of type tests on voltage detectors and phase comparators, and all type tests are done at overseas facilities. Now, if you go through those standards and you look at what are the requirements for type testing, then you must realize, is it necessary for South Africa to duplicate what is done overseas? In other words, a type test that is done or performed or ordered via the manufacturer of the equipment to say IEC, uh, because they will say IEC, they will not say SANS, they will say it's IEC compatible or com not compatible, compliant, so therefore it must go through a type test. And if you look at those standards and you look at all the requirements for type testing, it will be Absurd to say there must be a South African facility that can do type testing or redo type testing of that equipment. And for that reason, it is important to make sure if you purchase it, uh, high voltage test equipment to know does it comply to a type test according to the international or the accepted standards. Now again, what are the accepted standards? SANS standard because we work in South Africa. So therefore we can say comply to IEC standards. So that is what you need to be aware of that because we don't have the facility to do type testing, one must insist on a type test certificate from an accredited overseas facility. For voltage detectors and phase comparators, the range of in-service tests to be performed is recommended in the national standards. In other words, the international standard, IEC, which is now also the SANS standard, specify what in-service tests are recommended. It is not compulsory. We must remember that. In-service tests are not compulsory. But inherently it becomes compulsory via the OSH Act because it's safety. And the OSH Act and all that specify and enforce that your equipment must be specifically safety, must be compliant and safe to use. So via implication through the OSH Act and the compulsory acts and that, in-service testing of safety equipment must be done. So therefore, the national standard has got a range, and we will go through those tests, what are recommended for voltage detectors and what are recommended for phase comparators. Now, all that is based on two things. Firstly, the design of that equipment. You must understand the theory behind the design of that equipment to understand why certain tests are necessary. And secondly, is the conditions under which it is applied and used. Because we know in high voltage applications, there's a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration. In other words, what are the physical conditions? Let's take an example if we do a test on switch gear. 
and you now racked out your circuit breaker, and you now are trying to get this device into those uh, shutters, bus bar shutters, or whatever, to do a test. In other words, it's confined spaces, and it is a dangerous environment where the slightest mistake of a short circuit can cause an extremely violent arc flash and that. And that can be the result of poorly maintained test equipment as well. Right in the end of the presentation, I will show you a video of a test that was performed and it was a poorly maintained voltage detector and I will, tell, I will show you the consequences of that test. What happened? Fortunately, okay, I will leave that to when I speak about the video. So, which means that what we need to look at is that voltage detectors and phase comparators should be and must be tested maintenance in-service tests during the lifespan of that equipment. And we need to know exactly why we do certain tests. So the first one that we will look at is now voltage detectors. Now, voltage detectors are specified via SANS IEC 61243-1. And the important thing is that the heading, it says live working, which means that any test that you do on an electrical system to verify voltage present or not present is actually categorized as live working. And one must be aware that that is a live working situation and you're working with high voltage equipment. So live working voltage detectors part one is the capacitive type to be used for voltages exceeding 1 kV AC and it goes up, this goes up to 132 kV and so on. So it is not limited to medium voltage only. So this standard complies to all portable test equipment, voltage detectors for high voltage applications above 1 kV. So that is very important. Now, the criteria of maintenance tests we will look at and we will go through them in sequence of the tests. But what is the important thing that is stated in this standard? And this is taken directly out of the standard. Maintenance on live equipment in service is recognized as a basis for ensuring their good functioning and the safety of the user. It is the responsibility of the user to elaborate the maintenance schedule, taking into account the use conditions, storage, regular care, training of the user, etc. However, no voltage detector, even those held in storage, should be used unless retesting within a maximum period of six years. Now, interpreting that paragraph, how do we interpret that? A maximum period of six years. What is the recommended period? It depends how you use it. It depends where you use it. It depends how you use it. In other words, how do you treat that equipment? Do you treat it with gloves and clean it every time? Do you inspect it regularly for damage or not? Are you able to recognize the consequences of damage? And that is one example that I'm going to show you. Is a piece of damage on a voltage detector that actually looked very superficial. And what was the consequences of that during a test? So, two years, three years, four years, it depends on the user. And the experience of the user regarding that equipment, the conditions under which it is used. And one must be aware and not, like a lot of people say, okay, the standards say every six years. That's not what the standards say. The standards say a maximum period of six years, but it also says that it is the responsibility of the user to elaborate on the maintenance schedule. 
taking into account the conditions. And that is important that we recognize that. Now, there are recommendations. I'm not going to say, I recommend two years, I recommend three years. I think that is something for discussion, that what can you actually afford? What, can, what is your conditions that you work in? For instance, the mining conditions are far worse than a factory because the environment is different. So for mining, one should maybe go and say, okay, let's do a two-year, let's do a one-year. I'm not going to prescribe anything. All I'm saying is it is important to have a schedule and comply to that schedule. It is recommended that the maintenance be done by the manufacturer or at an agreed trained repair facility. The standard do not say an accredited or a SANAS accredited facility. It says be done by the manufacturer or an agreed trained facility. Now, repair facility, now what does that agreed means? It means it must be agreed by the user and the test facility and the user must audit the test facility and say, can this test facility do the tests recommended in the standard according to the requirements of the standard? In other words, there's a list of six, seven tests that need to be recommended that we will go through. Can the test facility do all those tests? Or can it only do one test? And that is the responsibility of the user to ensure that the repair facility or the test facility, let's say the test facility, can do all the tests that are required. So firstly, again, and I'm emphasizing it, that the user must familiarize themselves with what are the requirements of these tests. And then audit or inspect the test facility to say, can you do all these tests? And what are the reports received back from those test facilities? So what are the recommended tests now? Now this is the recommended tests for voltage detectors. And this is as it is stated in the standard. Firstly, a visual and dimensional inspection. Yes, visual inspection. Are there damage, etc.? What are the condition of the equipment? Now, why do we look at dimensional uh, factors in that? If one look at voltage detectors, you get them in the ranges. You can buy a voltage detector that says 11 kV. That's all. Which means that that voltage detector can only be used on 11 kV. Now, in the standard, there's a dimensional requirement for what are the length of your test prod. What are the requirements for the length of the test prod? Now again, there will be two applications. You get two standard types of voltage detectors. The one is for switch gear and the other one is for lines, which is overhead lines. The dimensional requirements of the test prods and everything for those two are different. So you cannot go and use a voltage detector that are designed for lines or specified for lines and the test prod and go and try and use it on switch gear. So one need to recognize that the equipment that are used are the correct dimensions. And we'll see an example of that in the slides of what normally comes with it. And then you can have a voltage detector that can be used for a range from, let's say, 11 kilovolts to 33 kilovolts, which means it must have a range of different lengths of test prods. A test prod for each voltage. And that test prod must be tested for that voltage itself. So if you have a voltage detector for a range of, uh, of voltages, you need to do a, a in-service test on each of those test prods. So you must actually do a full range of in-service tests for each test prod for its specific lengths 
and everything. So there's a lot of things specified that that voltage detector must comply to. Check the testing element. Now the testing element is the little device that either have a little flickering light, a red light, or it has a green light. Does that work properly? The international and the South African national standards got specific requirements of how does those two lights react to certain voltages. And therefore one need to see, is it working properly when you switch it on, etc. And then you can only use it. Leakage current under dry conditions. Now this is for indoor voltage detectors. Now, we all know that the test prod is the insulating distance. What will happen if you, for instance, measure and due to induced voltages, which I will explain a little bit more what is the consequences of induced voltages. Due to induced voltages, on the surface of that voltage detector where you actually hold it, there can be a voltage difference on the surface and that can cause a current to flow, a leakage current. And because it's a capacitive detector, you are handling it and you are actually in parallel with the capacitance that is used to measure. So that leakage current can then be lethal if the detector does not comply to it. In other words, you must be able to measure that leakage current and as we will see later on, what are the criteria for that leakage current? The threshold leakage current, the maximum, we're talking of 50, 50 microamps. Can the test facility measure that leakage current according to the standard, the setup, and measure 50 microamps? Then we have the protection against bridging. Now, we have a voltage detector, you have a test prod, you've got a live point at the front, you now press it into a confined space and switch gear. The test prod touches the high voltage terminal and it touches an earth part of the switch gear. In other words, you've now got a bridge on your test prod. What can happen if you bridge that? If that test prod is not in a good condition, it causes a short circuit the flash and you're sitting with a huge arc flash which means that you must actually test that total length of that test prod and the voltage detector against bridging that it is still safe to use and that it will not cause a short circuit between a live part and an earth part which is in contact with the test prod then you have spark resistance now that is a a little one that what are the consequences? We all know that if you are working with high voltage equipment and you approach a high voltage conductor, you get ionization of the air. So while you are now approaching that high voltage termination or terminal, before you actually make contact with it, there will be a spark due to the ionization of the air. What are the physical uh, attributes of an arc or a spark. It's actually a very high frequency phenomena. In other words, if you keep that voltage detector at that point and you continuously or for a certain time have a spark, does that high frequency phenomena of that spark and arc have an influence on your measuring device? In other words, under conditions where your contact is actually a little bit of an arcing contact, does the device still register properly? Does it measure or detect properly? In other words, you must test it that it still complies even if there's a small spark in that voltage detector where you actually make contact. Then the most important one, what is the threshold voltage? In other words, if one have, and I'm taking an example again, an 11 kV voltage detector, at what voltage must it say no voltage present? And at what voltage must it say 
voltage present. Why is it important? In most cases, when we measure voltage, it's not a single phase system. In other words, it's a three phase system. And you've got a number of high voltage conductors in your area, which means that you must look at induced voltages. I can have two, or let's say a three phase system. I want to test if one of the phases are dead. You've got interference through capacitive coupling from the other phases onto that one. In other words, although it's open circuit, the one phase, there can still be a voltage on it through induction. What will the magnitude of that induction be? It depends on the voltage level in that, which means that the voltage detector must be able to recognize, is it only a voltage due to induction? Or is it still a voltage due to a source being coupled to it? What one must remember, even if you measure and you say there's still a voltage present, but you recognize it's due to induction. What are the requirements of safety, high voltage safety procedures? It doesn't mean if you tested it that it is no voltage present that you can go and touch it. It only means that you can go and earth it to make it safe. And earthing has got a procedure, so you can only touch it after it's been earthed. But you must recognize is it safe to earth, which means it's an induced voltage and you can earth it without any severe consequences. But you cannot still touch it. So the voltage detector must be able to recognize is it induced or is it a real voltage due to a source coupled to it. That is the fundamental why a phase comparator cannot be used as a voltage detector. Because a phase comparator cannot recognize whether it's induced or not induced. It only looks at the voltage difference between two points. I'll come back to that one again. So threshold voltage is something that is specified based on the test voltage or the voltage of the system that you're busy testing. So there's a threshold voltage that you need to comply to because the detector is designed to recognize those voltages. The influence of in-phase interference fields, and that is what is the case with induced voltages. In other words, you have interference fields. And what do we say with interference fields? It's because it's capacitive coupling. The voltage detector works on capacitive coupling. So an electrical field in the vicinity can have an influence on the measurement. And you must test that voltage detector to determine what is the effect. And that is where the threshold voltage comes in as well. Because now you must test the threshold voltage based on in-phase interference fields. And you must also test it against opposition interference fields. In other words, there's different conditions which I'll explain. The last two are a little bit of a thing that can be, this, or let's say, looked at in different perspectives. If you look at the type testing, then for clear perceptibility of visual indication, it's a hugely complex method of ascertaining that. In other words, you must have light meters that you can measure light intensity, measure light intensity from different angles under different conditions in that to be able to specify or verify that that indication comply to the standards. In South Africa, we cannot do it because we cannot do the type testing. So in the clause, for clear perceptibility and visual indication, it makes provision that you can compare that tested object with a known object of which you can see that this is a new, let's say a new voltage detector. This is the intensity of the 
of the visual indication, and now I compare that one to this one under the conditions, and then say, yes, it complies. The same with audible indication, because most of the voltage detectors, or they should have a visual indication, a red light, green light, and then it must have an alarm audible that beeps to alarm. And the same with the audible. Instead of having sound meters at different distances and different angles and all the rest of it, you can compare the sound quality with a known detector during in-service testing and that. So a comparison may be made with a reference voltage detector of the same design for testing the clear perceptibility may also be combined with other previous tests on the list. In other words, they make provision for those two as in-service tests. The rest of them, the requirement and the procedure are exactly the same as if you would do a type test on it. There's no difference between the in-service test procedure for those first sub-clauses and the in-service test conditions, which means that the facility must be able to partially do the type tests according to the standards and the type test uh, applicable to the electrical type tests. We're not talking of the mechanical type tests and the, uh, all the rest of that, the shocks and the dropping and all the rest of it. So these are electrical uh, clauses that need to be complied to. If we go to number one, visual markings. What do we normally see? And we can see here that this drawing is with a court courtesy of DEN. There we have the manufacturer's name, trademark, and then whether it is IEC compliant. You will not find a SANS compliant one on the markings because it comes from overseas. So you need to look for the IEC compliancy. So therefore, in there you need to make sure that that voltage detector has been type tested according to the standard 612431 and it is an IEC standard. So that is a compliance standard reference and then all live working equipment must have a double triangle like that which means that it's been approved for live working. And those are the visual requirements that you need to look at as far as the markings are concerned. Then, what are the product? It's a voltage detector. What are the voltages? The nominal voltage, this one can be used to anything from 6.6 .6 to 22 kV and only applicable to 50 Hz. Which means that if you open this or if you get this, you should have test prods for 6.6 .6 kV, 11 kV, and 22 kV in it. Otherwise, if you don't have test prods for all three of those voltages in that thing, then this marking must be changed because you can only test it with the available test prods and certify it with the available test prods. So if it comes to the in-service test facility and it's a range and there's only, let's say, two test prods in, 6.6 .6 and 11 kV. Then it does not comply to that, and then this should actually be specified differently, and in the test certificate it must be stated that this voltage detector cannot be used on 22 kV because the test prod must be tested in conjunction with the uh, rest of the system to be compliant. And those are the things that one needs to remember. You cannot take a test prod from one detector and use it on a second one because it hasn't been tested with that second one. Then the insulating rods, in other words, each test prod or insulating rod must be specified. And with its, let's say, its, uh, its number, it's the, the test prod number, etc., on it. And that test prod can only be used with the detector that, are, that were tested with that. Then you look at the 
climatic category, which is humidity, indication group, in other words, indoors, outdoors, whatever it is, and then you have the product part number, or the serial number, part number, serial number, etc. So these things that are listed on the detector itself should be specifically stated in a test report. The facility that do the test on it must list all those things because that is the visual inspection, one of the visual inspections that you have is does it comply and that should be listed in the report. There's a typical voltage detector. Different test prods. You have two types, the category L, which is for lines. Lines has got a very short test prod. Why? Because you put an extension to it and you can have this element, the test element, far away from you. There, right up next to the overhead line. You don't need a very long insulating part or the insulating element to safeguard the person assisting it because you can put a link stick or whatever, an extension in there and your actual test element is far away. And it is important that this test element must be specific distances away from the point where you test. And that is where the dimensions come in. And there we can see that you have the maximum length of the insulating element for a voltage detector as a complete device. And that is the, insul the insulating length there. And you can see the lengths, the different lengths for the different voltages. And those are the dimensions that need to be verified when these uh, devices are tested. Then you must also know your test prod or your, uh, your test element there. What is the length? Because for each voltage, you will have a different length there. Does it comply? And the test prod contact electrode extension, it's intended to achieve the correct position of the indicator relative to the installation being tested. Because remember that your test element there, as we will see in one of the next slides, how does it measure and how do we determine the voltage there? And that is a direct function of the distance between this test element over there and the, uh, the point to be tested. Because you will have a capacitive coupling there and you have an electrical field around this device. And that magnitude of the electrical field actually determines what are the, uh, let's say, the measurement or the detection of that element there. And the longer test prods reduces the effects of the interference fields. Remember we talked about you must test for a in-phase and opposition phase interference fields. The longer the test prod, the lower the possibility of these uh, interference fields are. But you cannot now go and use a test prod that are actually for 33 kV and go and use it on 11 kV to say now I reduce my interference fields because that test prod is not manufactured for 11 kV it's manufactured and tested for 33 kV so that is the important things where the longer test prods are used for switch gear where the, you should have a fairly long distance between the test element and your thing Okay, so that is the dimensional and visual inspection that need to be done. Then you come to the test element. Now, this is a typical one where you have three, two lights, a green light and a red light. Now, how do you test the element? You don't test the element by putting it on a voltage source and find out whether the red light comes on. You must first test the function when switching it on. And therefore, you need to press the test button for approximately three seconds. After three seconds, you release it, and then you will get, or during that three seconds, you will get an acoustic signal, which means now you listen. Is the alarm working? 
is it loud enough by comparing it to another one? And you get the red light flashes. In other words, now you can see the visual indication. After releasing it, the green light should be permanently on. And then you can evaluate the intensity of your green light, whether it works properly. In other words, that voltage detector has been designed to go through this test procedure to determine that it is working properly. Not long ago, I got the voltage detector in, press the button, both lights start flashing and you hear the alarm sounding. Release it, it starts flashing for a couple of seconds, both of them keep on flashing and then it dies down. Only when you press the test button again. Which means that the test element is not functioning properly and you cannot carry on testing it with that. And now you've got to look at what is the problem with that test element. In other words, it's the first part of determining whether the equipment is ready for operation. A voltage detector without a self-testing element must always be tested on a live part of the installation as well. So now you get the, the, the voltage detectors that don't have the flashing lights. They've got a little voltmeter in them that says this is the voltage that you measure. I'm going to say something about that and I'm going to ask a question. Can we say that those voltage detectors are compliant to IEC or SANS standards? Why do I ask that question? We will see later on that to determine the threshold voltage, which is one of the routine, or one of the tests specified. How are you going to determine the threshold voltage of that voltage detector that's just got a voltmeter in it that's an indication? What are the accuracy of that little voltmeter indication, etc.? So I'm leaving the question in the room. If you cannot accurately determine the threshold voltage according to the standards, can we say that that voltage detector complies to South African national standards? And we will see what are the criteria for threshold voltages just now. Leakage current. So what do we have? There is the part of the voltage detector that the operator holds. What will happen if you have an induced voltage from a live part and that part is now earthed? In other words, that's where you touch. What can the leakage current be in that area? Now, this one is a little bit of a, uh, let's say, confusing picture. It's there to give you an indication of where do we looking at leakage current. We're not really looking at leakage current on the test prod. The leakage current on the test prod will be determined when we do the bridging test. The leakage current is what will the current be that flow when you have an induced electrical field in this area of your test prod or of your voltage detector. So therefore, one need to look at what are the criteria. The test voltage, in other words, you must apply a voltage that induces a current. And that test voltage should be 1.2 times UR for voltage detector having a nominal voltage lower than 123 kV. For voltage detectors having a nominal voltage of higher than 123 kV, that is the one, but okay, we will not actually look at that one because we will not be able to test it. For voltage detectors with a nominal voltage range, the test shall be conducted at the higher value of the nominal voltage. In other words, if you have a voltage detector from 3.3 to 11 kV or 22 kV, you must now do this test, induced voltage test, at 22 kV. 
not a 3.3 kV or 6.6 kV. That leakage current test must be done when you apply the highest nominal voltage to that detector. Now, according to the standards, how do we test it? You apply a voltage to the uh, a ring electrode. In other words, there you have a band electrode on the voltage detector. So you apply a voltage there. Now that voltage is measured between that ring electrode and the voltage detector cell. So you can see there that you've got your ammeter between that ring electrode and that band electrode. So you are actually measuring the voltage flowing, or the current, sorry, flowing on your voltage detector through those two band electrodes from high voltage to earth. Now, what are the reasons for these ring electrodes? That ring electrodes are there to ensure a fairly uniform electrical field. So you don't have a non-uniform electrical field which can have a severe influence on the ionization and the leakage current. So therefore, the leakage current on a voltage detector can only be done if you have this test set up. You have the, uh, the ring electrodes or the, let's say, corona rings, as we are also referring to it, and you have a band electrode. And that's why I say you cannot do it this way, because now you're only doing it where it touches. But you must actually make contact around the total circumference of your voltage detector. And therefore, you need to do it through band electrodes that are in contact with the total circumference, and then you can measure the leakage current, and the test shall be considered as passed if the leakage current never exceeds 50 microamps. So that is the criteria for doing a leakage current test. Now, bridging test. And now, what I said is, looking at the leakage current for your test prod and the rest of it. Because remember, we've now tested it in that distance there. You've not tested anything in this distance. So therefore now, you've got a special bridging test that is specified how you should do it. Now there's a number of tests that you can do, that you do over here. It's referred to as a bridging safety test, surface stress test, and the radial and surface stress test. So you've got, depending on the voltage, uh, nominal voltage of your detector, that length of your test prod will differ, but you have that red band, and there must always be a red band on your voltage detector there, because that is the, uh, what they call it, the insertion distance, or the limit of the insertion distance that you have. You start at a narrow distance, and that distance there depends on the voltage of the uh, voltage detector. So then at a certain angle, these two uh, bus bars uh, take a V-shape at this specific angle. So the first one that you do is you do a test where you take your voltage detector at the narrowest angle. The Furthest bus bar is live at high voltage, and the closest one is at earth. So now you start there, and you start with your uh, voltage detector, and while you are turning it, you are moving it. So you are actually testing at the lowest uh, or the smallest distance at that specific voltage. You're testing each and every little segment of that one in over that distance there. So you are turning it and you are moving it forward at the smallest separation. Once you've done that, then you start with the next one where you take the bar and you make contact to the high voltage and you rest the bar on or the detector on the earth bar. And now you start rolling it. And as you increase, and you must now test it up to the limit, insertion limit mark. In other words, you apply a high voltage from there. Now that means that your detection part 
is actually in your high voltage field where you've got leakage current that can flow across that distance there. And this is the dangerous part. If you make contact with a high voltage electrode and your test prod make contact with earth and the test prod is damaged, you're going to cause a short circuit there and you're going to cause an arc flash. And that is the most dangerous part that you can have. So then you have the, uh, the other test, which is the surface stress test, where you move the test the object and you touch it on the high voltage one and you move it up and down only on the high voltage bar where you make contact there. So that test and that one is very similar, where you actually short between the high voltage and the, uh, and the earth. The difference is that this one, you do it over longer lengths, where that one is done over a specific length, that one is that contact electrode is always in contact with a high voltage. In this case, you are looking at that test there and you move it over the distance. So the bridging test is one of the difficult ones to do. It's also the most important one or one of the most important ones. And now you can see what are the specifications for the bridging test. I said at a specific angle that you do it. Now, D1 is that small distance there in the V. And for any voltage detector with a nominal voltage of less than 7.2 kV, you're looking at a distance of 50 millimeters there. Now, imagine 50 millimeters is not a very big distance. And that is where you can do the bridging test. And that is the important one to, to do which is compulsory to do. Spark resistance, as I said, the test voltage shall be 1.2 times UN for a voltage detector having a nominal voltage lower than or equal to 123. Now, just the procedure to do it. The contact electrode shall be placed on bar A and the voltage detector shall lay on bar B. In other words, if we go back, there's A bar, this is B bar. So you contact make there and you lay it down there. So it's part of the bridging test, but it is stationary. Then you move. Then the voltage detector is withdrawn from bar A until the largest continuous spark occurs. So you bridge it, then you move it backwards and there's a spark between the contact electrode and the high voltage bar. And you keep it there for one minute. And during that one minute, your voltage detector must not malfunction. In other words, it will still give you that alarm voltage present all the time. So the phenomena of the sparking and the arcing should not have an influence on the ability of your detector to still measure correctly. Additionally, the voltage detector shall be pushed forward towards bar A seeking the longest possible spark between the indicator and the bar B. If a spark occurs, the position shall be kept for one minute. Okay, so that is the detector. The test shall be considered as passed if there is no damage to the voltage detector and the voltage detector is not shut off. Okay, so now to get the threshold voltage. To understand the threshold voltage, we need to understand the working of the voltage detector. How does it actually work? The principle of operation is that you have a voltage detector. It's got a little bit of electronics and everything inside. It's got a battery inside. How does it measure? It measures from your high voltage bar, uh, contact, bus bar, whatever you're measuring. And you will have a capacitive current. There you have a, what is referred to as a local earth electrode inside your voltage detector. Which means that now that earth electrode sits in an electrical field. So you've got an electrical field around your high voltage installation. That electrical field 
cause a current to flow through your detector. There you have an op amp, and the current flowing through that resistance R through your capacitive coupling between your voltage detector and your massive earth or the earth of your source. That current will determine what is the magnitude of that voltage that you have there. In other words, this thing purely work on electrical fields and capacitive coupling. So therefore, at what voltage should this determine that it is a true voltage or it's an induced voltage? And this is where the problem comes in. If one look at the operation, and as I said there, you look at the current flowing through that resistor R, through that capacitance C, which is the air. That is the air, the capacitance of the air. As you hold the capacitor, the voltage detector between your detecting element and your earth plane. And therefore, it is total capacitive coupling. If we now look at no interference field. In other words, this is a finite element plot of electrical fields. So there we have the bus bar that you test, which is high voltage. In this case, I've made it 11 kV. There you have your test prod of your voltage detector. There you have your local floating earth inside your voltage detector. So the electrical field between your test prod and your local floating earth, that voltage there will determine what is the current that flows through that resistor of your op amp. In other words, the Electrical stress in that area determines what, how will this voltage detector react. Now, this is under normal conditions. You have your high voltage electrical field, as you can see, and then you have your local floating earth. There's your earth plane. Now, what happens? Unfortunately, we don't only measure one phase. You always have other voltages in the area. So definition of the threshold voltage. The indication voltage present shall appear if the voltage to earth on the part to be tested is greater than 45% of the nominal value. In other words, what they say is if it is less than 45% of the nominal value, then you can actually say that that is an induced voltage and therefore the voltage detector should not be worried about it. In other words, 45% of the nominal voltage. And that corresponds to 0.78 of UN divided by square root 3, which is your phase voltage that you have. In other words, 45% of your phase voltage for an 11 kV system, whatever you talk about. So therefore, the one part of the threshold voltage is 45%. But that says the indication voltage present shall appear if the voltage to earth to be tested is greater than 45%. The indication voltage present shall not appear if the voltage to earth on the part to be tested is equal to or less than 10% of the nominal voltage. In other words, now you have a gap, a gap between 45% and 10%. And that is a gap where the voltage detector on uncertainty lies. Because it's capacitive coupling, it cannot be 100% accurate. In other words, you must now test and make sure that your voltage detector comply to those two criteria. Considered as the maximum phase to earth induced voltage normally encountered in the field. In other words, your voltage detector must be able to identify induced voltages and react on induced voltages and that correctly. And therefore, your voltage detector must be tested accordingly to see the influence of an induced voltage. And you cannot just say, I put it on a high voltage and this is the voltage at which the indication comes on. 
because you are not testing it with different induced voltages. So what does the standard say now? The threshold voltage shall satisfy the following relationship. It must be bigger than 10%, but smaller than 45% of UN minimum and UN maximum. What does that imply now? That implies that if you have a nominal voltage between 6.6 .6 and 33 kV, the threshold voltage applies to 10% of the maximum voltage when you measure 33 kV and 45% of the minimum voltage, which is 6.6 .6 kV. That is defined as a threshold voltage. If you have a voltage detector that only works on 11 kV, yes, it's easy. Then UN max and UN minimum is exactly the same. So what happens now? Now you have a situation where you measure and your high voltage electrode is not a specific distance. I've drawn a bus bar there to show that your high voltage part comes closer to your local earth, which means that that have an influence on your capacitive electrical field in this area now. So if you have a bus bar and you measure in the corner of that bus bar, you've got a high voltage electrode close to your earth part of your voltage detector. So that influences your electrical field that will have an influence on that resistor there. What does the standard say? The capacitance between the indicator box and earth can decrease due to the screening effect of the tested component itself. The same test voltage will cause a smaller test current through R because of the influence of your field, and I'll demonstrate that. The threshold voltage increases. The phenomenon is called the influence of in-phase interference fields and become more important as the indicator box is more enclosed by parts connected to the same phase as the test, test component. How do we test it? According to the SAN standard, you now have to have a high voltage electrode there and you have a high voltage ring, which is a ring electrode. So that is at high voltage and that is at high voltage and there is your indicator box. So now your indicator box move into that high voltage field. So it's not only the field of this electrode, but the field of this electrode that influences the capacitive coupling. For lines, which is overhead lines, they give that setup, which I will not really go through. I will demonstrate that setup further. It just shows that you've got different setups for switch gear category and line category. Now, if one look at the field plot, there we have a finite element field plot of a high voltage electrode, which is now closer to my local floating earth inside the detector. So now I can see that that electrical field there is smaller than what it was. And I'm gonna quickly go back and I specifically drawn it that we can see that number of lines indicates the electrical stress. So the number of lines there show the intensity of the electrical field. Those lines are separated by a voltage of 400 volts that I've specified there. So now by counting the number of lines, you can see what is the voltage between the detector and your local floating earth. In this case, we can say that, see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines. So we're looking at approximately four kV that sits between your test prod and your local floating earth. For the same setup, exactly the same distances, the same voltages, we can see that in this case, we're sitting with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. So which means the voltage between your test prod and your local earth has changed. The current through that resistor in your op amp will change. So the level of detection will change. And that is the influence of in-phase fields 
on the voltage detector, and this has an influence on your threshold voltage of the detector. For that reason, it's important to test according to how you're going to use it. What are the conditions in the field where you might have an in-phase interference field? So there you can see the voltage is much smaller. Now, what is the influence of opposition fields? That is where you have this one, can you see, is now earthed. So it must actually measure zero volts. But you've got your other two phases, which has got capacitive coupling now to your local floating earth. And therefore, you will get a voltage. You will measure a voltage there. But that voltage is equivalent to the induced voltage on your local earth or your floating earth. So that is a typical case of opposition fields. So what does the electrical fields look like? Okay, in, in the setup, what you now do is you earth your high voltage test point and you apply a high voltage only to your ring electrode, which means that this acts now as your opposition field from the other two phases that you are trying to measure. Same for the lines. What does that look like? Can you see one, two, three, four, five, six lines now? So again, your measurement of the detector is different under those conditions. Which means that for a capacitive type of detector, you must make sure that it operates correctly under all these conditions. Okay, that is voltage detectors in principle. I think you can realize now that a voltage detector is a detection device. It is not really a measuring device. It only detects that there's voltage present or there's no voltage present. In our high voltage field, to summarize this, in our high voltage field, we get induced phenomena due to capacitive coupling. We can even get induced phenomena due to electromagnetic coupling, but we will only look at capacitive coupling. Which means that you detect the voltage, you're not measuring a voltage. And that's why it's called a voltage detector. But now the detector needs to be able to distinguish between certain conditions and certain induced conditions to give you a proper indication. And for that reason, my opinion is that to have an analog little voltage measurement on a voltage detector means you cannot actually measure the threshold voltage according to the standards. Because you do not get a definite indication at 10% of this or 45% of that voltage. So therefore it makes it very difficult and the uh, the actual accuracy of that little analog voltmeter that they put on these detectors are such that you cannot rely on it. And I said I will come back to my opinion on that. And therefore, one must be very careful to evaluate and decide whether those detectors comply to SANS standards. Okay. If one look at phase comparators, phase comparators are specified by SANS 61481-2, again, live working, resistive type. Now, phase comparators, according to this standard, is the resistive type of phase comparators. What does that mean? That means that a phase comparator is a contact device. It can only operate if you make physical contact with the voltage sources. It is not dependent on capacitive coupling. It's dependent on a current that flows through a resistive element and measurement of that resistive current will determine the reaction of that phase comparator. Where the, uh, the voltage detector is a capacitive device. So it's not necessary to have contact to have an indication. And that's why we need to look at the spark 
test as well. Again, directly from the standards, maintenance tests should be carried out periodically on phase comparators to ascertain and, if necessary, make certain adjustments to ensure that their performance remains within specified limits. Now, what are those specified limits? No specified limits does not say there's voltage or there's no voltage, which means that it cannot be used as a voltage detector. Because in the first place, the limits of measurement is different. Voltage detector has got threshold voltage limits. A phase comparator has got a com combination of voltage and phase angle. So the limits and the design and the criteria is totally different. It is, again, the responsibility of the user to elaborate the maintenance schedule. I've gone through that. I'm not going to go through it again. And again, it is recommended that the periodic maintenance be done by a competent test facility, stated word for word like that in the standards. What are the recommended tests? Visual dimensional inspection. I've gone through that with a, with a voltage detector. I'm not going to go through it in detail again. Check of the testing element. We've gone through that. Leakage current under dry conditions. That's not fry conditions. That must be dry conditions. My apologies. We're not frying it like a barbecue. So uh, my apologies for the typo error. I did not pick it up. So... Uh, it's under dry conditions. Protection against bridging for indoor, outdoor type phase comparators. So the protection against bridging is exactly the same uh, as for voltage detectors, where you've got your V-bars and you need to check the bridging of that. The phase comparators are sometimes a little bit more difficult to do the bridging test. Why? because the phase comparators very often have an L-shaped test prod as well. And that is so you can get into your metal clad switch gear, depending on whether your prongs for your circuit breaker or your connections are vertical or horizontal, etc. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. So at the end, I'll show a video, courtesy of Den, of how the bridging test should be done with the L-shaped test prods and that. Spark resistance test, same. We've gone through that. Clear indication, the same. We've gone through that. Clear perceptibility of visual indication, we've gone through that. Audible, we've gone through that. A comparison, again, may be made with a reference phase comparator of the same design. That is for the Clear perceptibility of visual and the clear perceptibility of audible uh, indication. And they might be combined or they may be combined with the previous tests. There's a typical phase comparator. As we can see, it's got a connecting lead, which means it's a resistive type. You rely on the current that flows through there, where these test prods have got specific resistance values embedded, which means that, again, you need a specific test prod for a specific voltage. So the same things apply. It's a two-pole device, resistor phase comparator. It can only be used for phase comparison. It must be used in contact with the part to be tested, which means you must have positive contact. And restrictions apply on the use in factory assembled switch gear and electrified railways. So one must look at those things. But what is important, and this is what is stated, not to be used as a voltage detector. Why? Because this thing will not rely or will not distinguish between induced voltages and true voltages which means that if you have an induced voltage that is of a certain value that will still give the phase comparator indication that there's voltage present and there's a phase angle difference and it will say, yes, there's voltage present. 
but you don't know whether it is induced or real voltage present. So therefore, to eliminate confusion, you must not use a voltage detector, a phase comparator as a voltage detector, because it's two different criteria that you have. Okay, this is just to indicate again what you have is a contact electrode, the extension, which is the resistive part as well. Then you've got the indicator, the connecting lead, the insulating element. Uh, again, your insulating element for handle, length of extension, etc. How do we use the resistive phase comparator in the field now? So determine the uninterrupted condition of the system to be com compared and test the correct operation of a phase comparator. Remember with a voltage detector, you test voltage present or not present. In this one, you need to first do tests. So you've got two systems. The voltage, the, the phase comparator want to know what is the phase difference between L1 at that point and L1 at that point, L2 and L2. So first you must ascertain that there's voltage present on all those. Otherwise, if there's not voltage present on any one of those, then you're not going to get any indication from or correct indication from your phase comparator because the phase angle will be totally different. So you must first test L1, uh, L2, L3 for voltage. So you've got your test electrode on that. You test electrode 2, the one without the indicator on earth and the same on the other part. So then you determine that all those parts are live. Now you can go, and what is the indication? Sorry, the outer phase indication will indicate that the light will flash, and a flashing light means that it's out of phase condition. So you should get an outer phase condition between L1 and Earth, L2 and Earth, L3 and Earth. It will just tell you that there's voltage present, it will not be comparable to the voltage detector. In phase tests, now you test L1 to L1, L2 to L2 and L3 to L3. If they are in phase, no flashing light. If they are out of phase, you will get a flashing light. So that is the operation. It only gives you, yes, it's in phase, flashing out of phase. But what are the criteria now? And this is the important thing that you need to test. And this means that to test this phase comparator, the test facility must have two sources available, two high voltage sources, and the phase angle between those two sources must be adjustable between zero degrees and 360 degrees. Not 30 degrees only, not 60 degrees only, it must be adjustable, variable, between zero and 360 degrees. So therefore you need to have phase shifters and all things to your two sources up to the test voltages that you need to test. So for the in-phase, out-of-phase criteria, indication incorrect phase relation shall not appear for an angle difference up to plus minus 10%. In other words, plus 10% or leading, 10% lagging. So you cannot go and measure it on a fixed phase difference of 30, 30 degrees, as we know between line phase voltages, blah, 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 as you change it. So you need to adjust it from 0 to 10%, and during that, there should be no indication. Indication correct phase relation shall not appear for angle differences above plus minus 30 or plus minus 60 according to the class of the phase comparator. Class A phase comparator or a class B. So there you can see a class A phase comparator, the voltage or the indication of voltages should be between 10% and 30%. It will not appear if the angle is less than 10%, so incorrect phase relationships will not appear 
below 10% and it must appear above 30%. Ah, oh, 30 degrees, sorry, not percent, 10 degrees and 30 degrees. Which means that now you have a band between 10 degrees and 30 degrees that you need to look at. Or between 10 degrees and 60 degrees depending on the class of the face comparator. So therefore, there they specify 29.8 degrees. Now that's a little bit too accurate. If you have a phase angle meter that can measure 29.8 degrees, yes. If you, can, if you have a normal or a typical one, then you can measure 30 degrees. And 30 degrees will be sufficient in that. So, 10% of UN corresponds to 0.17 UN divided by square root 3 and is the voltage difference between two phases with an angle difference of 10 degrees. In other words, 10% corresponds to a voltage difference. In other words, if you have two 11 kVs, then with a 10 degree difference, the voltage will be 10% of that voltage. 29.8% corresponds to 0.51 UN divided by square root 3 and is the voltage difference between two phases with an angle difference of 30%. And then 57 or 60% is the same thing that you can read through. So from this we can see that the test requirements or the pass-fail requirements of a phase comparator can only be done if you can do phase shifting between 0 and 360 because you need to look at plus minus 10 degrees plus minus 60 degrees or 30 degrees whatever class you have there we can see the test facility there you can see the ring electrodes that are used for interference fields in-phase interference fields, opposition interference fields. There you can see the ring electrodes that are used for leakage current testing. So those are just two of them. And this is typically what a test facility should have, is the proper ring electrodes. And if you look at the standards, those ring electrodes must have a specific diameter, a specific height from your earth plane for your voltage detectors because that capacitance to earth is important for testing and that. So the whole test facility must comply to dimensions specified in the standards. Now the test facility available for this at the moment, which test can that test facility do? Visual and dimensional inspection, check of the testing element, leakage current to a, a, a accurate less than 50 microamps, protection against bridging with V-bars, etc. Spark resistance tests, all of those are yes. Measurement of the threshold voltage, influence of in-phase interference fields, influence of opposition interference fields, all of them yes. The clear perceptibility, clear perceptibility for visual and audible, yes, by comparison with a known detector. Which means that this test facility can do all the maintenance tests, in-service tests, as specified by SANS South African National Standards. The criteria of the test facility is that the test facility must be able to produce calibration certificates of the test equipment. And the calibration certificates must be issued by a SANAS accredited calibration laboratory, which will determine and specify the accuracy of measurements, etc. So, which means that, as you can see, as far as voltage detectors and phase comparators are concerned, the test facility can do all those in-service tests according to the standards.
there's a front page of a typical test report that will give you all the criteria that you need to test against. It will list all the calibration certificate numbers for the measuring instruments, which is SANUS accredited measuring equipment or measurements that are done. So regular maintenance tests ensure that the equipment is, in a, is functioning properly and that it is in a safe condition for use. All tests are performed to the requirements of the relevant standards, equipment standards, and documented in separate test reports. Okay, now I'm going to go and show you quickly a video uh, of how a bridging test is done on a phase comparator with 90 degree angle test prods. We just need to find the video quickly on the uh, on the laptop, and then we will will go. Yeah, that's it. Okay, there you can see that the it's a 90 degree angle test prod. There you can see the V bars. This video is also courtesy of Den. In other words, this video was taken in their test facility in Germany. And there you can see the typical bridging test of how you should determine between a live bus bar at the back, an earth bus bar in front, etc. Okay, the first observation that you should make, and I know there's going to be a question regarding that when I show the second video. This person is not... using safety gloves, etc. What is the reason for that? This is a demonstration of how it should be done. It's not necessary to say it's a live demonstration that the voltages are live. It's just a demonstration of the procedure that needs to be followed. Sorry, William. So which means at this stage, you don't need any safety equipment or safety applications. It is just to say that you need to test the whole element. And then in this case, you've got two of them, and both of them should be tested for bridging and that. Okay, thanks. Okay, now we will go to the test experience. Failures during testing. There's one example that I want to show you which is a damage to a test prod. Now, why doesn't that picture want to come up? Sorry. Oh, there it is. Okay, so that is a test prod. There's a little damage mark there. It's small. It's less than one millimeter damage to the surface of that test prod. When we did the bridging test, it flashed over, which means that if that was done in the industry, it would have been catastrophic. Now, again, I did that bridging test, and I'm guilty as charged that during that test, I did not wear a face shield, I did not wear gloves, and I'll tell you exactly what the reason is. The reason is that that high voltage source is only 100 volt amps. 100 VA at 33 kV. Now, 100 VA, 33 kV short circuit gives you milliamps flowing. So it was not necessary to wear arc flash safety equipment during the test because of the Energy in the test is very, very limited. So, yes, I can be crucified. I can be uh, accused. What I did is I did stand on a 
an insulated rubber mat, which means that I protected myself against leakage current that can be lethal. But I did not protect against arc flash because the energy in that arc was very small. Okay, so now we'll go to the next video. Thanks, Douglas, which will just show you the test that was done. And I personally did that, uh, that test. And there you can see the test facility with the ring electrodes and everything. You can see that there's the insulated mat, and I will walk closer and I will walk to the... I tested the element of the, uh, of the voltage detector. You heard it beep. And there it tells you that there's voltage present. Now, based on that distance, this was a 33 kV detector that was tested. And I was busy doing the arc test. You cannot see the arcing, arc resistance test there because the arc is very small intensity. And I was doing it for one minute. And while I was doing the arc test, the arc resistance test, you'll see now what's going to happen. Oops. Due to that small, less than one millimeter damage point on that voltage detector, imagine if that happened in industry with 33 kV with a 100 MVA transformer feeding that source. Catastrophic arc flash, destroying everything. This is practical experience of testing. And it's not the only one. We've had multiples of them. I just selected this one to indicate what happens. And if you don't do proper in-service testing of your equipment, what are the dangers? That voltage detector gave me voltage present. Yes, it works. Gentlemen, Questions, discussions, you are welcome. My throat is now a little bit dry. So for the first round of questions, I will ask you on to assist and so on. And then Douglas will assist us with the, uh, with the questions from the webinar. I think I've used my time productively. And please come up with questions, discussions. Douglas will have a roaming microphone. Uh, Johan, if you want to come and answer, you're welcome. We will share this little microphone. Hi, my name is Patrick. Um, so you would suggest if there's any cracks or anything, you don't even test the, the probe? Okay, from my point, from my experience, I would say if there are cracks, and so on, one must evaluate the depth of the crack. Because what we had before is you will get scratches, superficial scratches. And that superficial scratches can still mean that the leakage current, etc., is still within limits. And that scratch, scratches on the surface of your test prod means that it's not making short into your actual conducting element inside the test prod. So it still passes the test. So one must evaluate the depth of the damage and the severity. So if it is just superficial scratches, one can clean them. One must be very careful when you try and remove them, that you don't take too much off. So I'm not advocating that you should take sandpaper and now just try and remove your scratches and that. One must evaluate it and the evaluation will be proven by a test. But one need to be aware of the severity of the damage. This specific one was a very small dot, but it was deep. So it was easy to look over it and not see it, where we've had multiple others where it was superficial scratches. Johan, I don't know whether you want to elaborate on that or in your experience. Uh, yeah, thank you. Normally, you, you, will, you will do the visual inspection before you use the equipment. 
Uh, I mean, if we look at the, the implications of, of, of something going wrong on, on a medium voltage installation, if there's any doubt, uh, personally, I would I would remove it from service and and and, and have it tested, because if there's if there's a if there's an incident, uh, depending on the MVA source, it can be it can be catastrophic. Uh, so it's it's do you comply when when last was it tested? You see, the main the the, the, the main issue here is that we're using we're using uh, these sort of equipment in a cloud environment, so your so your insulation distances are reduced. And, and when you when you do test and you make contact with a, with an earth part, maybe the shuttle or another life part of the system, your your integrity of your equipment must be one hundred percent to prevent any uh, anything from happening. Please just use the microphone. You're using your eye for that visual inspection, and you are looking at something as tiny as one millimeter, you can easily miss it. Okay, my question is if we can have uh, an act of that magnitude, won't it be recommended that uh, you can use some sort of magnified glass to make sure that everything is okay? Because what you did was in a, maybe an academic facility, but if you get that in an industry, it can cause uh, lot of damage okay i would respond to that to say i don't think it will be necessary to use magnifying glasses or to that extent i would say training of your uh let's say artisans technicians that use this equipment in what to identify and how to identify it is very important so my answer would be training and looking from experience and to analyze and evaluate what is important to look at and how to look at it. Because if you have, as I said, superficial scratches in that, one can still look at that and evaluate it. But you must be able to identify what is the difference between a superficial scratch and a severe damage. And that is the criteria where the training, I think, is very important. Can I add to that? Okay. Um, I can, like to I to can perhaps just uh, give, give some input. Uh, as I said initially, the, the, the issue we have here is that we're using equipment in, in confined spaces, in, in a metal-clad environment where things can go wrong. If you look at the, the, both these IEC standards or SAS, SANS standards, they actually there's a clause that says there's restrictions when you use it in, in factory assembled or metal clad type of environments. So, and, and that is identifying the risk of, of your confined space, reduced insulation distances and the probability of the equipment um, causing, causing flash over. For instance, when you test you and you make contact with a shutter, if there's damage to the probe, it will, it will result in a flash over, which is proven by the breaching safety test. Uh, but the standards go a bit further. So if you look at, at, at 61243, which is, the, which is a suite of documents that covers voltage detection, uh, in part of this, there's five or six uh, uh, documents that forms part of the suite of documents. There's a part five. So it's 61243 part five, which covers what they call voltage detecting systems. Now that specification uh, or standard was, was, was developed especially for indicating or showing the absence or presence of voltage and doing phasing in metal clad environments or metal clad switch gear. So, so, uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a system that, that works on, on also capacitive insulators that provides a signal to you as the user in the front of the panel. So you don't open the panel, the panel remains closed. You get an indication of voltage present or not voltage present. You can do phasing. Uh, and you are physically exposed to to a low voltage uh, coming from the coming from the the divider that's in the in the panel, typically about five volts or up to ninety volts, depending on the type of system, whether it's uh, a high resistance or low resistance modified. So the standards do make do make uh, a provision 
for for safer methods to test in to test and do phasing in in metal clad environments and that's why the standard specifically refers to the point that there are restrictions when you use the, this sort of equipment to part one and and and, and the phase comparator the resistive or, or capacitive type in a metal clad or factory assembled type environment so there are other solutions uh, which i think that is more safer than 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 uh, what we're doing at the moment with uh, pushing these instruments into a, into confined into confined areas. Prof, um, how's your feeling with institutes using the word calibration of test equipment, high voltage equipment, but yet on a phase comparator test you can't really calibrate it. It's got a voltage or no voltage, a red light or green light or audible sound. I've got my specific viewpoint on that, which is most probably sometimes debatable, and a lot of the people can debate it. I interpret calibration as stating in a, on a test certificate what is the uncertainty of your measurement that you've done and what is the accuracy of the uh, results that you publish. That is what I classify as calibration. In other words, in the first place, that uncertainty must be specified through a special procedure, which is a very difficult thing to calculate. It's a mathematical thing to calculate uncertainties of measurement. And then to specify what is the, the deviation or the accuracy of that value that you've put on there, which means what is the accuracy you must compare it to a value given in a standard or some traceable value. So which means, in my opinion, to say that you've calibrated the voltage detector, a capacitive voltage detector is untrue. It's not a calibration, it's a test certificate to specify that it complies to the criteria given in the standards, in other words, to say, as I mentioned, that the threshold voltage of this voltage detector complies to the criteria in the SANS standard. It's between that and between that. It's not calibrated because I'm not saying what the deviation of that is. I'm just saying it complies between that percentages and that. So I did not calibrate the equipment. Yeah. Okay, so that is my opinion that on voltage detectors and phase comparators, you cannot calibrate them yeah. unless you open them and you make adjustments and specify what is the... That's correct, yeah. So which means that you must actually just issue a test report to specify that you've tested it. That is my opinion. It can be debated. Sorry, Prof. I think I can also... I do agree with your opinion. And... I think it's a mistake where people where people do not understand between the uh, a meter and an indicator. If the voltage detector was a meter, then yes, maybe we could consider the word calibration. But the fact that it's an indicator, there is no, as you were saying, there's no analog or digital element to it to for us to to calibrate, if I may say. Thanks for that. I agree with that. Okay, I think then we can move, Douglas, if there's any questions that came through from the webinar side. Uh, Douglas will uh, voice the questions. Nothing. Okay, so uh, I've used exactly two hours, which is, uh, I think, enough that uh, you will be able to get some CPD credits for that. So from my side, I would just say thank you very much for attending. I trust that I've opened a little bit of a, a thought process about this testing of safety equipment and that. So to conclude on that, thank you very much. You are now welcome to enjoy a little bit of a late breakfast. Let's call it a brunch. So from my side, thank you very much. And I think from your honest well. <laughs>